Cedric Mullins has really not been that all-star type player since his 30-30 all-star season in 2021, but every so often since then, we see the flashes of what he can still be. And certainly, Monday night was one of those flashes as Cedric with the bat and with the glove leads the Orioles to a 7-4 win over the Twins. And I'll recap it all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, April 16th, 2024, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' 7-4 win over the Minnesota Twins on Monday night to take game one of a three-game set. I'll get you the five things you need to know from that one, including a big day for Cedric Mullins, the top of the Orioles lineup really producing, and the starters continuing to not get so deep into games and what that may do to the Oriole bullpen. Then we'll talk a little bit more about the Orioles' outfield conundrum, Colton Kowser and Austin Hayes. Kowser coming off a Player of the Week award. Hayes coming off another O for how will the O's handle this situation going forward? Chat about that a bit too. Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and load Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. So we start tonight with an Orioles victory. Final score from Oriole Park at Camden Yards on Monday night. The Baltimore Orioles 7 and the Minnesota Twins 4 in Game 1 of a three-game series. Orioles extend their streak to 97 consecutive regular season series without being swept as they get the Game 1 victory. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles win. And the first thing you need to know is Cedric Mullins absolutely had himself a night in this one. And it all started in the top of the first inning. Runner on third base, two outs. Kyle Farmer is at the plate against Cole Irvin for the Twins. And Farmer absolutely demolishes a baseball out to deep left center field. He hit it 367 feet. Now, it wasn't going to be a homer, but it looked like it was going to for sure be an RBI double and put the Twins up one nothing. And Cedric Mullins tracking it back and tracking it back. Full Superman leap, kind of back and to his right, makes an insane catch to end the inning, save a run, keep it 0-0, a miraculous play. And these are the plays we just continue to see Cedric Mullins make in center field. Even when he is struggling with the bat, he makes these plays in center field. He is a gold glove level center fielder. And that is why I continue to say, hey, look, the Orioles have an outfield crunch coming up, probably at the latest by the end of the 2024 season, heading into next year. They're going to have to make some tough decisions on their veteran outfielders. If you're keeping one, for some reason, you can only keep one of Mullins, Hayes, and Santander. I'm keeping Cedric Mullins because of what he can do for you in center field. And if he's playing defense that well, anything he gives you on offense is a plus. And that's the thing. He's also giving you production on offense as well. Hit a two-run homer in the fifth inning. Not absolutely crush the ball, but into the flag court in right field that put the Orioles up 6-2. to two. Kind of basically ended the day for Louis Varland, the Twins' right-handed starter on Monday night. Now, that was his only hit of the night, but Mullins now on his seven-game hit streak is 9-for-19 nine in that stretch and has home runs in back-to-back -back games after also going deep on Sunday. He's swinging the bat well. He's playing gold glove defense and not a lot of pressure. He's hitting, you know, Seventh in the Orioles order, like this is the best version of Cedric Mullins, and you absolutely love to see it. Second thing you need to know from Monday's win is that Jordan Westberg just continues to kind of be steady and awesome for the Orioles. Hitting sixth in this one on Monday night against a righty. I mean, he's basically an everyday player at this point. There has only been one game that Westberg has not started so far this year, and he continues to be awesome. Westberg with a three for four with a double, two singles, and two RBIs and had four hard hit balls on the day. His average now up over 300 at 302 with a 920 OPS on the season so far for Westberg. Came up huge in the first inning. Twins completely just 
biffed a routine ground ball double play. Orioles end up loading the bases with one out. Colton Cowser at the plate. You're thinking he's delivering. He strikes out. Then Westberg's at the plate. You're like, all right, you got to deliver. And he cracks a two-run double on the ground in the left center field to put the Orioles up to nothing. Had a couple more hits, scored a run later in the game as well. And his hard hit percentage, which is right around 60% right now, is above the 95th percentile in all of Major League Baseball. He's just crushing the ball. And early in the season, he wasn't getting super rewarded for that. Now he is getting rewarded, and that's why that average is all the way up over 300 now. The double was at 102 off the bat. The single in the third, 108 off the bat. Single in the fifth, 98 off the bat. And even the ground out in the seventh, 105 miles per hour off the bat and had a 430 expected batting average. He is hitting the ball well. He's getting rewarded now, and it's not like he has to hit second or third in this Orioles order. There's so much production ahead of him that he might be like the best number six hitter in all of baseball right now, and that's one of the pieces that just makes this Orioles offense so, so dominant. I mean, three hits in two of his last three games, he's he's just swinging it so well right now. And it wasn't just Jordan Westberg, because I mentioned the top of the Orioles order gets a lot of production too, and the top four in the Orioles lineup on Monday, well, they certainly did a lot in this one. The top four against Louis Varland, the twin starter, was Gunnar Henderson, Adley Rutschman, Ryan O'Hearn, and Ryan Mountcastle. And each of those four guys had two hits apiece. Henderson, two for four, also had a home run in this game that he absolutely clobbered out to right center field, hit it 108 miles per hour off the bat, 411 feet for his fourth homer of the year. He also had three hard hit balls, all close to 110 miles an hour. Adley Rutschman had a two for four game with a couple of singles. Ryan O'Hearn continues to crush the ball. He's now hitting 325 with an OPS over a thousand. He went two for five, also had himself a homer. That thing that O'Hearn hit, like my goodness, the solo homer that O'Hearn hit in the third inning, 435 feet, 109 off the bat to dead center field. O'Hearn now homering in back to back games for the Orioles after going deep on Sunday as well. You add in that Ryan Mountcastle had a couple of singles in this game. I mean, the top of the O's order getting eight hits combined from the top four. That is going to put a whole lot of pressure on opposing starting pitchers, and, and that's just exactly what they did. Seven runs on 12 hits total for the Orioles' offense in this game. They got to Varland. Now the Twins got a little lucky. Matt Bowman, who they just activated, came in and gave them three innings of one-run ball in relief to completely save the Twins bullpen after Varlin gave up six runs on 11 hits in five innings. Matt Bowman completely saved them. So the Twins bullpen still intact heading into games two and three, but the Orioles offense did everything else they needed to do and of course did enough to win this game. The big thing we saw as well with the homers from Mullins and Henderson and O'Hearn, got a new homer hose or dong bong, but however you like to call it, but this one has four hoses coming out of it. Cedric Mullins said after the game that he said James McCann went on Amazon and bought it, and this is the first game they've debuted it, and he just said, I have no idea what he searched to find that. There's pictures uh, on Twitter of this uh, this new dong bong the Orioles are going with this year. Got even more hydration stations, and uh, Ryan O'Hearn went hard at it after his homer, and uh, fun to see the guys hitting bombs and uh, having fun in the dugout as well. Fourth thing you know from this one is that Cole Irvin certainly kept the Orioles in this game, making his third start of the year, but once again, just was not super sharp. Now, this was his shortest start of the year. He did not last five, came out after four and two thirds innings, but he also did a lot better at limiting damage in this game. Two runs on six hits against Irvin and four and two thirds. Big thing was he did not allow a walk, struck out four, did allow a home run and threw 82 pitches, seven hard hit balls by Twins batters against Cole Irvin. And he gave up four runs in five innings and then five runs in five innings in the first two starts. So even though he didn't last five, I would say this is Cole Irvin's best start of his three so far this season. Like this was better. He kept the ball on the ground. He didn't put guys freely on base. He got more soft contact. Like across the board, it looked better for Irvin, but it's still not good enough. And a guy you want to send out there every fifth day. It was only three swings and misses. It was not like he was showing dominant stuff. Again, he's just kind of holding the line right now until John Means and Kyle Bradish come back. Again, it could be a week or two until Means is back. We got good news on Kyle Bradish. He's going to throw a rehab start in double A buoy tonight on Tuesday night. They're planning to have him throw 40 to 50 pitches and kind of go from there. This will be his spring training buildup. And 
The O's could have him back by early to mid-May, which would just be incredible to have Bradish back in this rotation if he's healthy. But Irvin is one of the two placeholders. I said on Monday's episode that I feel like if Means came back right now, I would actually keep Irvin in the in the rotation, excuse me, and send Tyler Wells to the bullpen. I think after this start, I still agree with that take, but I would basically still be hoping Bradish came back shortly after so you could move Wells and Irvin to the pen and, of course, get Means and Bradish in there. But I think the biggest issue with Cole Irvin's start, I mean, he only gave up two runs. That's solid, but it was only going four and two-thirds because that made it four straight starts where an Orioles starting pitcher did not pitch into the sixth inning and six consecutive starts where an Orioles pitcher failed to complete a full six innings. What that means is your bullpen is starting to get taxed, and there has not been an off day for the Orioles in that stretch. Their last off day was last Monday. Their next one is coming up this Thursday after this twin series ends. But without any days off and with you know the bullpen having to come in starting in the sixth inning in every single game for the first time this year, you know, the O's now with the win are 10 and six on the season. So 16 games in, you kind of have your first bout of, okay, the bullpen is a little bit tired and it showed a bit. I mean, I thought Dylan Tate was really good again in this one, inning and third scoreless, but Keegan Aiken, who had a perfect ERA coming in, allowed a single and a double, had to come out of the game, didn't look as sharp. In your Cano came in, gave up a two run double that charged the first two runs of the year to Keegan Aiken. Cano actually gave up a couple of hits in this one. Now the Orioles bullpen still did its job, and Cano got big outs in the eighth, and Craig Kimbrell came in, got a one, two, three ninth with two strikeouts to pick up the save. But what this continues to do with these shorter starts is have a snowball effect on your team and specifically on your bullpen. So yeah, they even though they had a little bit of struggles Monday, they got through it and got the W. But you had a game where you were leading seven to two in the seventh inning, and you had to use your closer. And because the O's used Cano for 20 pitches tonight, they had also used him Sunday. They used Kimbrell on Monday night, had also used him Sunday. You go into Tuesday's game with arguably your best two relievers in Yinyer Cano and Craig Kimbrell right now. Neither of them are available. And so if the O's get into a save situation on Tuesday, you're probably looking at Danny Coulomb going for that save. And that's not a terrible thing. Coulomb is a great reliever, but he's not really a guy who's gotten a lot of ninth inning chances. So you're kind of already putting yourself in that spot. You also won't have Dylan Tate available for Tuesday's game. And you probably won't have Keegan Aiken. I mean, you could argue it was only 16 pitches, so he would be more of a maybe, I would say. But Tate threw 21 pitches. I don't know if they're going to send him back out there. So you could be looking at a game on Tuesday where you go in with the Mike Bauman, Danny Coulomb, Johan Ramirez, Jacob Webb combo, which doesn't exactly feel great coming out of your bullpen. And you hope that Grayson Rodriguez can give you length. But if not, that is where it starts to snowball. You either need a lesser reliever to really step up or you need a starter to just throw seven and kind of reset the issue here. Hopefully one of those things does happen on Tuesday. But either way, O's get the win on Monday night to take game one of the series. And surprisingly, despite scoring seven runs on 12 hits, despite getting a win, they really got nothing from Colton Kowser, who just came off an insane week and probably had his worst game as an Oriole, even counting last year in the game on Monday night. But that doesn't take away what he's been doing so far this season. And coming up next, we'll talk about the award that Kowser won on Monday and just how good he has been so far this year for the Orioles. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Now, I'm a pretty competitive person. Yeah, I've got a competitive side. We all do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times, and it's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on iconic properties, just like in classic Monopoly. But now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. 
And this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Game Time. Now, we are fully into this Major League Baseball season. One of the best parts of it is Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and even easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. They've got these killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Truly, you can go to the game and you can stand outside Camden Yards and that price will go down. I've done it before. I've bought the tickets right there. And you can get a last minute deal. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute tickets for sports, including the Baltimore Orioles. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On MLB. That's L O C K E D O N M L B for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. So the Orioles get the win 7-4 to four over the Twins on Monday to open up a three-game set. And really, they got that win without the help of Colton Kowser. He goes 0-4 for 4 wearing the golden sombrero. Four strikeouts for Kowser as he got the start in right field, hitting fifth with Anthony Santander getting the day off on Monday. And... Didn't really expect it from Kowser. Kind of started off rough. He came up with the bases loaded and one out in the first and struck out. Luckily, Jordan Westberg behind him came through with the two-run double. But you didn't expect that night from Kowser because he just came off winning AL Player of the Week. That was the award given to Kowser on Monday after an insane last six games last week when he started all six games and had a 335 WRC plus in that stretch. In the six games for the Orioles, Colton Kowser last week came to the plate 27 times. He went 10 for 23. That is a 435 batting average with three walks, six strikeouts, four homers, four doubles, 12 RBIs, and oh yeah, he was two for two stealing bases, a 481 on base, an 1130 slugging percentage. That's a great OPS. No, no, that was his slugging percentage with a 16-12 OPS in the Orioles' six games last week. He was unbelievable. And shout out to Masson for this stat, which uh, came out on the broadcast on Monday. Colton Kowser was the first Oriole with four or more homers, four or more, du more doubles, and 12 or more RBIs in a six-game span since Frank Robinson did it back in the 60s. Yeah, that's a pretty good name to be alongside of in the Oriole record books. And it just continues for Colton Kowser, who even with the 0 for 4, and what a bum with his 0 for 4, is still hitting 395 with a 1297 OPS on the season. He's still statistically been one of the best hitters in Major League Baseball so far this year. And he's still striking out a little bit, not walking a crazy amount, but he is hitting. And that is what matters for the Orioles right now. And, and what's been even better for him is he's even in there against the lefties. I mean, right now, Colton Kowser is an everyday player right now in this Orioles order. He started against the lefty DL Hall on Saturday. Heck, on Sunday, he homered against a tough lefty. He gave the Orioles a huge insurance run with his solo homer in the eighth on Sunday against Hobie Milner, who's like a funky submarine lefty who isn't like the most dominant reliever in the world, but he's a ground ball guy with the, with the funk and the break on his pitches. He just doesn't give up a lot of homers. He throws a good sinker up and in, kind of jamming Kowser, and Kowser just got his hands out there so well, turned on it quickly, and blasted that thing in a right field for a solo shot. Like That's not something I thought Colton Kowser could do, and he has shown it even against left no, left-handers. Now, he's still been better against righties, and I think he always will be, but to do that against lefties as well and to be swinging such a hot bat, I mean, he is going to be in there every day at this point. And Brandon Hyde said as much on Monday. He was asked about, you know, how he's going to split this playing time with Austin Hayes still being a big part of the team and having Colton Kowser so red hot. And Hyde said he's really going to try and ride the hot hand when he can this year. And of course, Colton Kowser is the hot hand in the Orioles order right now. And Brandon Hyde is certainly putting him in there every single day, whether it's a righty or a lefty starter. But Hyde also said he wants to be cognizant of still getting Austin Hayes in there knowing Austin Hayes has been a big veteran part of this team and still wants to get him as at-bats and give him a chance to kind of break out of the slump he's in right now. But either way, Kowser's an everyday player until further notice. And, and what a turn it's been for Colton Kowser. The struggles he had last year, gets sent back down to AAA, doesn't make the Orioles postseason roster last season, but has a great spring, makes the opening day roster, sits for a few days, 
but then gets into the lineup and just has not left that Oriole lineup the last two weeks. And he's going to continue to be there and he's not going to swing at this. Well, he's not going to hit this well forever. I mean, he was over four with four strikeouts on Monday night. Like he's not always going to be just absolutely mashing the baseball. But I think while he's not going to hit 400 all year, that's not happening. This is sustainable enough for him to be a really good big league hitter. That's what it looked. I mean, he was a first round pick his fifth overall selection in the 2021 draft by the Orioles. Like he is a good, good player and he's showing that right now. And I think he's proving again, he can be an everyday player, even against lefties and just shout out to him for getting that award, getting that recognition again, AL player of the week for Colton Kowser really couldn't have gone to anyone else. He was truly the best hitter in the American league in last week's time. But with Kowser taking all these plate appearances, it continues to raise the questions. Okay, what do the Orioles do with the rest of the outfield? And specifically, what do they do from with Austin Hayes? Because a lot of these plate appearances have been taken directly from the veteran Hayes. So coming up next to finish off the pod, we'll take a look at Austin Hayes right now. He did get the start Monday. He did not get a hit. It is rough to watch him at the plate right now. Can he break out of it? Can he get enough time to break out of it? Will he ever be an everyday player again for the Orioles? I'm going to try to answer those questions to finish off the pod. Coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by LinkedIn Sales. Are you struggling to close deals? B2B selling is tougher than ever. And that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. It's fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, and Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people that matter. So right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That is linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on to get started. So I mentioned the Orioles won it 7-4 on Monday despite an 0-4 from Colton Kowser. They also won it on Monday despite an 0-4 from Austin Hayes. And although those two combined to do a similar amount of nothing for the Orioles order, they've had very different goes of it so far early on through 16 games this season. Kowser just won AL Player of the Week. He's been one of the hottest hitters in baseball. Austin Hayes has been one of the coldest hitters in baseball. Hayes, who only really got the start against the right-handed pitcher Monday night because Anthony Santander has been struggling a bit. I think Brandon Hyde wanted to give Santander the day off, and he did on Monday, which allowed Hayes to start in left field, Kowser to start in right, and then Ryan O'Hearn to DH while Ryan Mountcastle played first base in the Orioles' order. And I think it was a good time to get Hayes back in there against a right. He hadn't seen a lot of right-handed pitching over the last couple of weeks as he struggled. He didn't take advantage of it. He went 0 for 4 now. Positives of the 0 for 4. He did not strike out. And he hit two balls hard. And I will say... In Hayes' final at bat in the bottom of the eighth inning, he should have had a hit, plain and simple. Rocketed a ball to third base. Probably felt like off the bat that should have landed in left field for a knock, but the way he's been playing and the way they had Jose Miranda shaded at third base, he made the catch to retire Hayes and finish his day at 0 for 4. Now, as I mentioned, he did have two hard hit balls, which is nice because Austin Hayes has not been hitting the ball hard. Basically at all this season, had a ground out at 96 in the second. And then that line out was 105 miles per hour off the bat, had a 690 expected batting average. So you liked that swing from Austin Hayes and some of his swings last week when he came off the bench in that Boston series were better, was making better contact with the baseball, but it's still not consistent hard contact. It's not like we're saying, oh, Austin Hayes is getting incredibly unlucky. And that's why his stats are what they are right now. That's not the case. After the 0 for 4 on Monday night, Austin Hayes is hitting 077 on the season. He is three for 39 with just three singles, no extra base hits, three walks, 10 strikeouts in his 42 plate appearances so far this season. Not good. Not good. And Colton Kowser has already pretty much equaled him now in playing time. Colton Kowser has also had 42 plate appearances on the year. And I read out his stats earlier. He is doing much, 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 much 
much, much, much better than Austin Hayes. And that is why, as I mentioned, Kowser's pretty much an everyday player right now. And I think overall, at this point, Hayes still has a way to be consistently maybe the small side of a platoon in left field. So what that means is Kowser as the left-handed hitter would play against righty pitchers. Hayes as the right-handed hitter would play against lefty pitchers. And because you just see way more righty pitchers than you do lefties, Kowser is considered the big side of the platoon because it's not an even split. He would play more. Hayes would be considered the small side. But there was a really good piece in the Baltimore Banner on Monday from my favorite writer over there probably in John Mioli. And he talked about a lot in that piece, and I, I suggest you to go read it. It's a, a great read about this whole Hayes, Kowser, Orioles outfield veteran versus young guys situation that they're going through right now. He talked about how balancing Austin Hayes is going to be tough here because you want to factor in how much he's meant to this Orioles team throughout the rebuild, how much production he's given you in the past. Heck, the guy was an all-star last season, but that was mostly first half, and then he really, really did struggle in the second half last year and really hasn't broken out of that since. And you take that into account versus Kowser breaking out and Kerstad and Stowers looking you know, ready as they sit down in AAA Norfolk. You factor in all of those things in the Orioles outfield. And Mioli writes about how it's kind of the first time the O's have had to make this kind of decision under Brandon Hyde with this kind of veteran. He mentioned you know, there were a lot of kind of bad veterans on the really bad Orioles teams. They were just placeholders. Then a young guy would come up and they DFA the old guy because he wasn't very good anyway. Now you have veteran players who are good, productive players like Hayes, even like Mullins, like Santander, but you can make a strong argument that the young guys coming up behind them have higher ceilings. I mean, kind of guys like Jorge Mateo and Ramon Arias fit, I think, into this category with these other veterans as well. It's a more whole encompassing question for a lot of the hitters on this Orioles roster. Like, how do they get through this season, getting guys at bats, keeping them healthy and keeping them on the roster? Now, Brandon Hyde, as I mentioned, said Monday he wants to ride the hot hand, but still make sure Hayes got in there and Monday worked well because Santander had the day off, but it's not always going to work that well. I think I'm fine with Kowser and Hayes being in a platoon, knowing that Kowser will play more. And I think you can find other ways sometimes, like maybe sit Mullins sometimes against lefties and let Kowser play center field while Hayes is in left field to get them both in the order. Like you can find other ways to get those guys in the order. You could have Kowser be the DH against left-handed pitching sometimes to get him in there. Like I want him to be, at least at this point, riding the hot hand, a mostly everyday player, but it's going to be tough. And the issue with that platoon too is Austin Hayes has never really been a lefty masher. He's been generally fairly even against right-handed and left-handed pitching offensively throughout his career. It's not kind of been his calling card that, oh, he's a righty who just kills lefties. Hasn't really been him. So a platoon like that doesn't truly fit Austin Hayes' skill set, even when he is hitting at his best. So... If we get into late May, maybe June, I mean, I don't see Austin Hayes being taken off this roster, but if we get to that point and Hayes is still struggling, I mean, there's a chance that Kowser is just an everyday player, Mullins is in there, Santander's in there, and Austin Hayes just essentially takes over the old Ryan McKenna role. He is a fourth outfielder. He starts against some lefties. He can pinch run for you if you need to. He might pinch hit. He'll be a defensive replacement in the outfield for Santander a lot of the time at the end of the game, so he'll still get in most games because he's a huge upgrade there if you bring him in for Santander defensively. I mean, he's the Orioles still. He is the Orioles' best corner outfielder defensively, so he still helps you. But I just, I don't know. And and John Mioli brought up the point, like, weren't the Orioles training Jorge Mateo to do that job this year? Like, play better defense in the outfield, hit against lefties, play the outfield, also be a very good pinch running option off the bench, and that is what he is. I just don't know how long Austin Hayes can survive as a player making $6 million to be a fourth or fifth outfielder. So, it's going to be tough because the O's, if they wanted to break out of the slump, they got to play him, right? You can't just keep sitting him because you know the talent's in there. And I'm I'm not saying it's time to get rid of Austin Hayes. Like he's been such a good hitter for the Orioles for so many years. You got to at least give him a chance to break out of it because if you have Hayes and Kowser going, well, then you're really cooking offensively for this team. But to get him going, you got to play him. And it's hard to find spots to play him right now. It's helping him a little bit that Santander is also struggling a bit early in the year. So maybe you can interchange those guys for a little bit. But Mullins is swinging it well. Kowser is swinging it well. Like you want O'Hearn and Mountcastle in there almost every day because those two guys are mashing the baseball. It is just tough to find spots. And this is what we knew was going to happen for the veterans this year. Now, I thought it would happen to Ramon Arias, and it has so far. I mean, Arias just like isn't starting anymore. He's a full-time bench player. And Jorge Mateo is the utility guy. Arias could be gone fairly soon here if they want to bring up another infielder. 
But I didn't know what happened to Hayes so quickly, where it's like there's just so much competition for these lineup spots. If you struggle for two weeks, you're going to be sent to the bench. And if you struggle for two months, you might be out of a roster spot. Now, Austin Hayes does still have a minor league option left. So the O's, if they really wanted to, could send him to AAA for a bit just to get him regular at-bats. That could happen. He wouldn't like it. It's not something you want to do to a veteran player, but it could happen. That is an option the O's have there. It's just, this is going to be tough. I think there's going to be a platoon where Kowser also plays against some lefties while Hayes is in there, and they'll go with that for about a month or so more. And if Hayes is still really struggling, like, Kerstad's going to be knocking on that door, right? Mayo, uh, other guys are going to be knocking on that door. It's could be a really tough decision for the Orioles coming up here with Austin Hayes. He doesn't have like crazy trade value either. It's it's a really tough spot. And John Mealy writes just like this could be Brandon Hyde's toughest decision yet as Orioles manager. I'm not sure how they fully play this out, but it's going to be really interesting to watch. But right now, I'll tell you what, Cows is an everyday player and Hayes at best is a small side platoon. And we'll see if he can get enough playing time to kind of fight his way out of there and get back into getting semi-regular at-bats. Because, again, if Hayes can turn back into the first-half version we've seen of him the last two years, the all-star version, think how much better this Orioles team could be with that version of Austin Hayes in there, too. We shall see, though, what goes on in that Oriole outfield. But that'll do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you are liking, commenting, and subscribing to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page and leaving a five-star rating and a review wherever you listen. Hope you like the new podcast open today as well let me know your thoughts on that in the tube comments i'll be back tomorrow we'll be recapping game two between the orioles and the twins it is grayson rodriguez who takes the hill for the o's in that one mentioned six straight starts with nobody leading innings that would be a very nice time for grayson rodriguez to complete six plus innings for the orioles here tonight he'll go up against chris paddock who is back from his injuries big time change up guy from the right side for the Minnesota Twins, been solid through two starts this year. Last time out, though, only went four innings against the Brewers, two runs. He has not even thrown five innings in either of his starts so far this season. I'll be back tomorrow to recap game two and talk a bit about Kyle Bradish and his rehab start he has in Bowie on Tuesday night. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.